Hi, in this video I want to continue talking about cyclic groups. And specifically I want to go over a theorem that says that every subgroup of a cyclic group is also cyclic. So this is an interesting theorem. It tells us that we can have no non-cyclic subgroups of a cyclic group. So let's go ahead and actually prove this theorem. But before we do that, I want to introduce a little bit of notation. So if we have a group G with the binary operation star, and it's a cyclic group with a generator A, meaning that all elements in G can be obtained by repeatedly applying the binary operation star to A, then if we have an element in G that is obtained by repeatedly applying the operation N times, instead of writing out A star A star A dot 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 N times, I'm actually just going to use the notation of A to the N. Also, a to the zero will represent the identity element for our group, which we'll call e. And then finally, if we have a to the negative m, this means that we're repeatedly applying the binary operation star to a inverse m times. So using this new notation saves a lot of space, it's a lot easier to write, and also with it we can see that we can use multiplicative properties. So it's definitely more convenient, so I'll be using this notation for the proof. So let's go ahead and get started with the proof. So we're going to say that G is our cyclic group, and since it's cyclic, we know that there must be a generator, so we're going to call that generator A. And of course that means we can write the entire group as the set containing integer powers of A. Now remember we're trying to prove that every subgroup of this group is cyclic. So let's first start and say that H is a subgroup of G. And you might see it using this notation here, where we have H with a little less than or equal to sign G. And that really just means that H is a subgroup of G, so this is just a different way to write it. Alright, so our goal is to show that H is cyclic. Let's first start with the trivial case. So our subgroup H is just the identity element. And of course we know this is always a subgroup for any group we have. So it's definitely a case we need to look at. So if H is our trivial subgroup, then we know that the identity element is its own generator. And so H is cyclic. So now let's look at the non-trivial cases. So we're going to assume that our subgroup H is not the trivial group. So it's not the group that just contains the identity element. Now by assuming this, we know that there must be a non-trivial element in our subgroup H. So let's call that non-trivial element X. Now of course since X is in our subgroup H, we know X must also be in G, meaning that X can be written as A to the power of N for some integer N. And we know that just from the fact that it's in our group G. Now notice that any element in our subgroup H has to have this form. So it has to be of the form of A to some integer power. So now I want to do something which will make a little bit more sense later why we're doing it. So I want to look at the element in our subgroup H that has the smallest positive power. So we'll let M be the smallest positive integer such that A to the M is an element in our group H. So M is the smallest integer that's greater than or equal to 1 such that A to the mth power is in our subgroup. And let's let the letter B represent this element A to the mth power. Now what we're going to claim is that our subgroup H can actually be generated by this element A to the mth power, which we said equals B. So it can be generated entirely by this element B. And if we can show that this is true, then of course we know that our subgroup H is cyclic because we found a generator. So the rest of this proof will actually be proving this claim, that H is generated by this element B. All right, so in order to prove our claim that H is cyclic, we need to show that any element in our subgroup H can be written as a power of our element B. So let's go ahead and say that C is any element in our subgroup H. So of course, for the same reasons as before, we can write C as A to the X for some integer X. Now for the next part, you're going to need to remember the division algorithm. And I'll give a quick reminder of what it is. It states that given any integers X and Y, there exists, that's what this little thing, this backwards E, this means there exists. So there exists unique integers Q and R such that x can be written as y times our quotient q plus our remainder r, where we have r is greater than or equal to 0 and less than y. So if you need to review the division algorithm, you can click on this link here. It goes through some examples and a proof of it. But for now, I'm going to assume you know what it means and how it works, and we're going to use it in this proof. So applying the division algorithm to this integer x and this integer m, 
which we said was the smallest positive integer, such that a to the m is in our group h. What that tells us is that there exists unique integers q and r, such that we can write x as m times q plus a remainder r, where we have r is greater than or equal to zero and less than m. So now that we have x written like this, we can rewrite our element c. So we had c equals a to the x, which we can write as a to the m times q plus r. And we can rewrite this where we have a to the m to the qth power times a to the r. Now notice that this a to the m is an element in h. And since h must be closed under our binary operation, that means that any power of this element must also be in h. So we know that a to the m to the q must also be in h. And finally, since we know that h is a subgroup, we know it is a group, meaning that every element has an inverse. So we know that there's an inverse for this element here. And we'll call that inverse a to the m to the negative q. And we're gonna multiply this inverse to both sides. So we'll multiply it to a to the x, and we'll multiply it to this. And when we do that, we'll get this a to the m to the negative q times a to the x, and we'll say that this equals a to the m to the negative q times a to the m to the q. But since we know these two are inverses of each other, we know that they cancel out and they go to the identity. So really we would end up with the identity e times a to the r, which of course just equals a to the r. So what we've done is we've written a to the r as a to the m to the negative q times a to the x. And it maybe isn't so clear right now why we did that, but actually the reason for doing this is to show that in fact a to the r is an element in h. So since we just said that a to the m to the negative q was an element in h, and from above we said that a to the x was an element in h, that tells us that their product must also be an element in h. And since their product equals a to the r, that means that a to the r is an element in our subgroup h. Now notice our restriction on r from above. We said that r had to be greater than or equal to zero and less than m. But also remember that m was the smallest positive integer such that a to the m was in h. So since m is the smallest positive integer where we have a to the m in h and we know that a to the r is in h with r greater than or equal to zero and less than m, that means that r can't be a positive integer because that means it would be a positive integer less than m and it would contradict our assumption. So that tells us that r must equal zero. And so finally, if we go back here, we would get that a to the x actually just equals a to the m times q. And so we can write that as a to the x equals a to the m to the qth power, which equals b to the qth power. And this really completes our proof because we took any arbitrary element c in our group h and we showed that it had to be a power of b. So that implies that h is generated by b and our group is cyclic.